the Mind Flayer. A horrific, humanoid organism, the mere mention of which strikes fear in the heart of even the most seasoned adventurer. Tales of slithering worms breaching the brain, of stolen consciousness, and of grotesque feeding rituals have plagued us all since childhood. Also known as Illithids, this enigmatic and secretive species has existed for untold eons, and though many are aware of the danger they pose, unlike many other species in this realm, little is known of Illithid biology. As such, my own quest has been to unravel the mysteries of these creatures' anatomy, physiology, and life cycle, and to demystify a species whose very nature has left them cloaked in shadow. In my relentless pursuit of the knowledge of these creatures, I've taken risks, some of which have brought me unsettlingly close to their world. Now, though much is yet to be learned, I invite you to join me as we explore the biological mechanisms that facilitate one of the most terrifying transformations known to sapient life. I also invite you to keep an open mind, for although the process is fearsome, it is, in many ways, equally fascinating. Of course, my studies of these and other creatures are both deeply researched and meticulously catalogued. As such, I have to be ruthlessly efficient. Allow me to pull back the curtain and show you one of the most useful pieces of software I've ever used, Opera Web Browser. Now, like me, you may have heard about Opera before, but now Opera have truly upgraded the experience with Opera One, and it's packed with features built for modern usability. See, these days, a web browser needs to do more than just show you websites, and the Opera Web Browser is a one-stop shop. Ad blocker? Built in. A free VPN for privacy and security? It's built in. Chat integration with Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, and more, so I don't have to have tabs clogging up my window? Built in. I also love the seamless integration with music streaming, so I don't have to constantly find the tab I had open just to click next in YouTube Music. As I mentioned, I do a lot of research, reading, and note-taking. I used to have dozens of tabs open, which got to be overwhelming very quickly. Opera has solved this problem with Tab Islands, which allow you to separate tabs into different groups and collapse or expand them, which makes organization so much better. In the sidebar, I can even switch between research and personal workspaces, so I can take a break and jump right back in where I left off. And of course, no modern web experience would be complete without AI. But unlike some others, Opera One's Aria, as it's called, doesn't feel like an afterthought. It's free and built right into the sidebar, and even better, directly from a command line for quick questions. Personally, I use it all the time to briefly explain or expand on snippets of text right from the context menu and even translate other languages. There are a ton more thoughtful features that I could go on about, but let's just say that if you're looking for a better way to enjoy content, click the link in the description and check out Opera Web Browser today. The true origin of the Mind Flayer is not fully understood even now. They are an undeniably ancient lineage, equally adept at traveling through space and, apparently, time. Current paleogenomic analyses suggest that illithids share a distant evolutionary lineage with a creature similar to modern cephalopods. These ancestors likely inhabited vast underwater realms, exhibiting both predatory and complex social behaviors. Indeed, certain molecular markers, particularly the unique protein sequences found in illithid mucus, bear a striking resemblance to specific cephalopod species, suggesting an aquatic origin. In terms of societal structure, illithids exhibit a hive-like community centered around what is known as the Elder Brain, a massive, ancient mass of gray matter submerged in a brine solution. This communal organ serves as both a repository of collective knowledge and a governing entity. Genomic studies on rare Elder Brain samples have identified a unique set of neurotransmitters tentatively named psi serotogens that facilitate the telepathic connections within the colony. These compounds have not been found in any other known species. But those abilities are of course not limited to the elder brains. In fact, the psionic power of every illithid is one of their most defining and feared attributes. Historically, these abilities have not only been tools for hunting and defense, but also fundamental in establishing the illithid's dominance in many realms. These advanced cognitive manipulations have the power to invade and influence the very thoughts of other beings coercing, manipulating, and dominating the will of almost any creature. However, even among experts, the origins and mechanisms of these abilities remain topics of fervent study and discussion, and it is this area wherein, admittedly, we still have the most to learn. In any case, the illithid's relationship with other species is predominantly predatory. 
Mind flayers are well known to consume the brains of their victims, and even to enslave entire sapient species, utilizing them as both a labor force and, eventually, as hosts for their offspring. Their parasitic reproductive strategy, which we'll explore in more detail shortly, has positioned them as apex predators in nearly every realm. But while their predatory nature and psionic abilities are the things of legend, understanding the Illithid requires a closer look at their developmental journey. And even along the path of scientific discovery, this journey is not for the faint of heart. Drawing from extensive observations, dissections, and advanced biomolecular analyses, I present to you now a detailed record of the Illithid's disturbing transformation, beginning with its earliest form, the tadpole. The life of an Illithid begins in earnest as a writhing parasite, markedly different from its adult shape. Known simply as tadpoles, these creatures, while seemingly innocuous in this larval stage, carry within them the genetic potential to transform their host into one of the multiverse's most horrifying organisms. Each tadpole emerges from a clutch of roughly 1,000 eggs laid by mature illithids, which are hermaphroditic and spawn only up to two times in their entire life. These clutches are laid directly into the same briny reservoir that houses the community's elder brain, a point to which we'll return shortly. Tadpoles hatch with a full set of external gills, are subsentient, and even late into their maturation, will only reach a maximum length of about 3 inches. But as the tadpoles grow within the elder brain pool, they face a brutal competition for survival. Brain meal is prepared and provided by adult illithids, but even so, tadpoles are not averse to cannibalism, and the elder brain itself will consume hundreds of these young. In fact, on average, only 1 in 1,000 will survive until the next phase of their life cycle, a process that takes roughly a decade. Genomic sequencing of these tadpoles has revealed a high concentration of transformative genes, which remain dormant during this stage, but are crucial for the next. Additionally, the presence of neurophagic catalytic enzymes are abundant in their digestive systems, and appear to be designed specifically to break down neural tissues. As the tadpoles reach their full length and development, they are ready to begin the next phase and the beginning of one of the most horrific and fascinating metamorphoses in the biological world. Ceramorphosis is the metamorphic bridge that facilitates the transition of a seemingly benign tadpole into the dread-inspiring form of an adult illithid, all while nestled within the confines of a host's skull. After surviving a ruthless decade of cannibalistic competition, the chosen tadpole is plucked from their nursery pool and introduced into the brain of a captured and incapacitated host, typically a humanoid selected for their physical and cognitive traits, ensuring that the emerging illithid will inherit optimal attributes. The insertion can be through any cranial orifice, though the ear canal or nasal passages are most commonly used due to their direct paths to the brain. Within moments, the tadpole will have anchored itself to the brain. Within an hour, the infection, so to speak, will have become completely irreversible. Indeed, I have very personally observed that beyond this time frame, there is no point in resisting. As the illithid feeds, proteolytic enzymes swiftly break down and assimilate neural tissues, much like our own digestive enzymes. At the same time, growth factors, morphogens, and a cascade of hormones are released, each intricately designed to instigate and guide profound physiological and neural transformations. The entire transformation process takes, on average, seven days, and during that time, the face of the host undergoes one of the most dramatic alterations. Within mere hours, the skull begins to elongate, driven by rapid proliferation of cartilage and bone cells under the influence of fibroblast growth factors. This process is similar to the growth spurts observed in adolescent humans, albeit at a highly accelerated rate. The mandible and maxilla in particular are entirely remodeled as new layers of bone tissue are added. But of course, one of the more iconic pieces of illithid anatomy are their tentacles. As the maxilla and mandible extend, four distinct regions on the lower face begin to exhibit increased cell activity. These regions, rich in mesenchymal stem cells, will become the sites from which the tentacles will sprout. In short, these stem cells are triggered to differentiate into chondrocytes and fibroblasts, the former responsible for cartilage formation, providing proximal structural support to the tentacles, while the latter produce the collagen and elastin fibers that give the tentacles their flexibility and strength. Over the span of a few days, these cellular masses continue to elongate, driven by the fibroblast growth factors and morphogens released by the tadpole. As the tentacles grow, a hollow tube is left within, forming a duct that runs the length of each tentacle. 
Meanwhile, at their bases, a specialized gland begins to form. These glands and their associated ducts will become vital for the secretion of the specialized enzymes that the illithid use to breach the skulls of its prey, a point to which we will return. The tentacles are densely populated by nerve endings, making them highly sensitive to touch and vibrations. A proliferation of muscle fibers within the tentacles give the illithid precise control, while angiogenesis spurs the growth of crucial oxygen-transporting vessels. Simultaneously, the mouth undergoes a complex reshaping, forming into a round, lamprey-like orifice equipped with multiple rows of tiny, sharp teeth. At around the midpoint of ceramorphosis, the host's hands also begin to exhibit alterations. The index finger begins to recede, and the remaining fingers elongate slightly, becoming more dexterous. The nails, usually once flat and thin, thicken and turn a deep black, although they remain blunt. A portion of the host's internal landscape also undergoes a radical transformation, driven by a series of biochemical reactions. The liver, responsible for detoxification and metabolic processes, enlarges to handle the illithid's unique dietary needs, primarily the digestion of the brain's rich lipids and proteins. The kidneys, responsible for filtration, adapt to excrete the waste byproducts associated with such a diet. Changes also occur in the dermal layers of the entire body, in both color and texture. The skin adopts a violet or deep mauve hue, a result of increased melanin production combined with the unique biochemicals released by the tadpole. This change in coloration could also be adaptive, allowing the illithid to blend into their dark, subterranean habitat. Proliferation of subdermal mucus glands also occurs, giving the skin a smooth and slimy appearance, characteristic of many amphibious species. But perhaps the most intricate part of the tadpole's induced changes is the integration into the host's nervous system. In essence, the tadpole appears to release numerous neurotrophic factors, or proteins that support the growth and differentiation of developing neurons. As it feeds on the brain, it spares many of the essential neural pathways, instead forming synaptic connections with them. This delicate process, which I have termed synaptic usurpation, allows the tadpole to effectively hijack the host's neural communications. The tadpole can then begin to generate and propagate its own neural impulses. Ultimately, however, the transformative journey from host to adult illithid isn't just morphological or even neural, it's genetic. As the tadpole establishes itself within the brain, it secretes specialized enzymes similar to DNA polymerases and ligases in human biochemistry. These enzymes work in tandem, snipping specific sections of the host's DNA and replacing them with illithid sequences. Eventually, this process, known as genomic assimilation, will ensure that every cell in the host's body will carry the genetic markers of an illithid. As the host's cells undergo their regular cycle of division, they read these new instructions, producing proteins, enzymes, and other molecules vital for the illithid's existence. This genetic fusion is what makes the ceramorphosis process fundamentally irreversible. In short, the host's original genetic blueprint is entirely replaced. Interestingly, while the process of ceramorphosis is comprehensive and overwhelming, there are known cases of incomplete transformation. These anomalies, often collectively called partialism, generally manifest themselves as the incomplete sublimation of the host's original brain and result in the retention of fragments of the host's consciousness. For a time, signs of partialism go unnoticed even by the afflicted illithid. These signs can range from behavioral quirks, like the tapping of fingers reminiscent of the form donor, to the humming of a tune once familiar to the host, or even the unconscious writing of words in the form donor's native language. These fleeting behaviors may appear when the illithid is dazed, groggy, or preoccupied. Such occurrences, though rare, are deeply distressing for the illithids and considered to be taboo. In fact, an illithid that becomes aware of harboring a partial personality will go to great lengths to eradicate it. Worse, illithid society regards those with partial personalities as unfit, deeming them unworthy of joining the elder brain at the end of their lifespan. We'll return to that later point in a moment. But in a vast majority of cases, by the end of the seven-day period of ceramorphosis, the host's original brain has been completely supplanted. The illithid brain, now fully integrated within the reshaped cranial cavity, has taken over all bodily functions, from basic motor skills to the newly acquired psionic abilities. The process, as horrifying as it reads, does have a certain beckoning that's difficult to articulate, but it's better not to dwell on this for now. In any case, once the process is complete, the host itself has been erased from existence, and what remains is a fully formed adult mind flayer.
As previously discussed, the Illithid's anatomy showcases a series of specialized adaptations. My own dissections of adult specimens have shed a great deal of light on the more mysterious aspects of their anatomy and physiology, and I am eager to share my findings with you now. First, let us return to the Illithid's iconic tentacles. These appendages originate from muscular bases and are rich in vascular structures. Within the tentacles, proximal to the base, lie the aforementioned enzymatic glands, which are crucial to the illithid feeding process. You see, these glands synthesize a unique enzyme designed for rapid tissue dissolution. Biochemically, this enzyme is a protease, breaking down proteins present in bone and flesh, and, when released through the tentacle's central duct, facilitates rapid penetration into the prey's skull. Interestingly, the enzyme structure contains unstable bonds that degrade upon exposure to oxygen, rendering it inactive within a very short span, a feature that adds to its functional specificity. Internally, other than the aforementioned changes, mind flayers possess many of the same organs and system as standard humanoid creatures, as, with the notable exception of vocal cords, among others, they largely retain them in the transformation process. But though adults breathe air just as humans do, minor changes to the respiratory system do include increased alveolar density in the lungs, allowing for efficient gas exchange even in oxygen-scarce environments. Notably, the Illithid's visual system is highly specialized, able to detect infrared radiation, an ability known as infravision. It appears that Illithid retinal cells possess specialized photopigments sensitive to longer wavelengths, especially those corresponding to the infrared spectrum. This adaptation compensates for the lack of visible light in their chosen habitats and allows them to detect the thermal signatures of potential prey. Adults lack external ears and even a nasal opening, so while they can hear well, it is not a primary sense and the ability to smell, if it existed in their host, is lost completely. Air is inhaled exclusively through the mouth. As previously mentioned, the illithid epidermis is coated in a slimy mucus, but unlike most amphibious creatures that share this adaptation, it doesn't only serve to retain moisture and prevent desiccation. Produced by goblet cells and mucus glands, this layer is imbued with biocrystalline structures that act as psychic resonators, amplifying these creatures' innate psionic capabilities. But now, though it is the least understood aspect of mind flayer biology in modern science, we will turn now to what I believe to be the source of these creatures' psychic power. Even cursory observation will reveal that the illithid brain is not like any other known species. First, as the brain undergoes its transformation during ceramorphosis, an increase in the density of neural synapses and dendritic branching occurs. This enhanced connectivity allows for faster and more efficient transmission of neural signals, which is critical for the facilitation of their psionic abilities. Additionally, in most species, neurotransmitters such as serotonin are pivotal in regulating mood, memory, and cognition. But in the illithid brain, I have observed unique neurotransmitters that seem to operate in tandem with traditional ones. These psi serotogens, as I have called them, are synthesized in specialized neural vesicles and are released in response to specific neural stimuli. Amazingly, they appear to at least assist with translating neural activity into potent psionic waves. Psi serotogens exhibit a complex molecular structure with both typical chemical components and what are perhaps unique quantum components. Much more study is necessary to understand this fully. Upon release from their synaptic vesicles, psi serotogens don't just bind to postsynaptic receptors as typical neurotransmitters do. Instead, they resonate, creating a kind of psionic field around the neuron. When many such neurons release psi serotogens simultaneously, these fields can intertwine and amplify, creating a more substantial telepathic field. This mechanism could explain how illithids are able to communicate without the need for vocal cords or audible sound. Their very thoughts generate waves in the psionic field, which are then read by other illithids through the resonance of their own psyceratogens. These communications are undoubtedly reminiscent of whispers, unintelligible at first, but growing in volume, calling out continuously. Even I have heard voices like these, and I believe I am beginning to understand it. Additionally, the illithid brain exhibits specific regions, like the thalamus and other species, that act as centers of relay and amplification. These centers enhance the potency of their psionic signals, ensuring that they are robust and far-reaching. But it's not just about generation. Their brain also has specialized structures for storing this psionic energy. 
I think of these as biocapacitors that hold on to generated energy until it's needed. When an illithid decides to deploy its psionic abilities, these reserves are tapped into, ensuring a consistent and powerful output. But of course, apart from their distinctive morphology and abilities, perhaps the most infamous aspect of the Mind Flayer is their routine ingestion of sapient brain matter. I must apologize in advance, for we must move through these sections quickly as a matter of personal urgency, and I am finding it difficult to speak. For the Illithid, cephatophagy is not a matter of personal preference as some have thought. It is a biological necessity. In fact, the act of consuming a brain provides both nutritional and psychic nourishment. From a nutritional standpoint, the brain, rich as it is in lipids, proteins, and essential nutrients, offers a dense source of energy. But not all brains are created equal. Sapient brains, those of beings capable of complex thought, emotions, and self-awareness, contain a myriad of specialized neural structures and biochemicals that simply aren't found in lesser creatures, and these neural configurations and associated molecules are crucial for the illithid's diet. They not only provide a richer nutritional profile, but also a unique blend of neurotransmitters and hormones that are beneficial if not essential for the illithid's physiology, especially in supporting their advanced neural and psionic functions. As you might have guessed, this unique dietary requirement greatly affects the Mind Flayer's hunting practices. The need for sapient minds, specifically, is foundational to the illithid imperative of domination, and has even led them to cultivate entire humanoid species, ensuring a steady supply of that precious, delectable nourishment. At this point, I have presented the form and function of the Mind Flayer itself, a true wonder of biology. But as briefly mentioned previously, no discussion of these creatures would be complete without mentioning what is, for the Illithid, their ultimate form and the centerpiece of our culture, the Elder Brain. The Elder Brain is a large aggregation of neural tissue that holds dominion over an entire Illithid colony, housed in a central location and in the same brine pool that acts as a nursery for their young. It is, in fact, composed of the cast-off brain tissue of recently deceased Mind Flayers united in consciousness. It is the right and duty of every Illithid to one day join the Elder Brain in exalted mentality, and though many believe that their individuality is retained therein, this is not the case. Functionally, the Elder Brain embodies not only the accumulated knowledge and experiences of countless Illithids, but also plays a vital role in our societal governance and cohesion. It serves as a telepathic hub and an unfathomable repository of knowledge, its vast networks of neurons continually releasing and reuptaking psi serotogens. This establishes a pervasive psionic field around the colony, and though it is not a hive mind by any means, it ensures constant communication and synchronization of thought among its members. My observations of the Elder Brain has revealed firsthand an overwhelming psychic aura that envelops its vicinity. Even at a distance, its presence is palpable, exerting a pull on the psyche that is difficult to resist. Even now, as I finalize this documentation, I find myself asking questions that had never occurred to me. Would union with an intellect so vast truly be something to be avoided? To be part of a culture so ancient and refined? To feast on the very seat of consciousness? There is no sense in fighting it. I began this journey by asking you to keep an open mind, but perhaps it would be best if you didn't keep it at all. This video was made possible by the Opera web browser whose link can be found in the description and by viewers like you. Thank you, and remember, you matter.